It's all things motion design today, and we've got the fabulous Heather Seidel with us. Heather is an Emmy-nominated motion artist, visual designer, and art director, and she has spent time working for The Wall Street Journal, where we met, NBC, MTV, Google, Microsoft. She's also lent her fabulous skills to Seabury Design. Heather describes herself as working at the intersection of video, motion, and design which I'm really excited to get into with you and, and, and where what that means. I love that description. When she's not doing the dang thing is teaching it. She has taught over 8,000 students how to animate via Skillshare, which is amazing. Welcome to the podcast, Heather. We're so excited to talk with you today and to find out everything about motion design, where it is, where it's going, and, and how you got into it. Thanks for coming to Seabury Talks. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here yeah. and to see you guys at the end. It's like a little reunion, too, because I remember when I started the Wall Street Journal, like the first day, they rushed me in, sit me right next to you. And it was the start of this great relationship, this great friendship. We learned so much about each other, but I feel like it was also the very start of you getting into animation. I remember like sitting next to you and you were literally like in it, in that point of learning how to use After Effects. Yeah which was, I don't know, it might feel like a long time ago now, but what do no, you- No, it, it doesn't feel like that long ago. I remember um, your like first project that you worked on too, you were doing some animation and like we were working on that together. <laughs> we no, were, I, was, I was sitting there crying, <laughs> like, why am I doing this? Because you were so busy with all the work that you had. And I was like, Heather, please tell me what is a mask, help, please. <laughs> And you're like, oh, yeah, it's this, it's this. But I don't really have time for this. I was like, I know. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was great. Well, you actually like... kind of made that whole animation in the end. And I'm like forever grateful to you. So last time we had a, a like a, just a very basic question. I, you know, me coming from video, him coming from user design. We don't know all the ins and outs. What is the difference between animation and motion design? Yeah, I think it, it's going to depend on who you ask. Um, to be honest with you, I think those two terms get like conflated quite a bit. Um, the way I see it is I, when I think of animation, I think of like more traditional animation, um, like 2D, Disney style, cell frames, um, stuff like that. Or I think of like Pixar animation. And when I'm thinking of motion graphics, I'm thinking of more like vector based um, graphics that are embedded in videos or digital advertisements, stuff like that. So. Um, a little bit like, I guess, more approachable, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, I, but yeah, that's kind of how I see it. You seem to incorporate uh, a lot of, so you mentioned vectors. So for those that don't know, that's basically um, mathematically calculated lines, very, very crisp. But at the same point in time that you're doing that, I've noticed you, you add a lot of photos, uh, a lot of other kind of components, even backgrounds that are really Complica complicated or complex how does that fit in like the motion graphics is it seems like it's this blend of all of these things combined yeah you're right it isn't just all vector based stuff um, a lot of motion graphics artists will also use traditional cell animation techniques in their motion design and um, there are other elements involved like collage style motion graphics which is a lot of stuff that I do um, it's kind of like a mishmash um, different things um, depending on the animator and I think that's kind of what's so beautiful about the art form is like it's kind of um, it's like you as an artist however you like to express yourself um, that's kind of like what your motion design practice looks like right so um, yeah it's a little bit different for everybody that's why it's so hard to define I think and like pin down a definition for it well you say like that you put yourself kind of at that intersection of video and graphics and design and I guess, it, you know, it's all of those things kind of coming together. Did you know that's someplace that you wanted to be? Did you know you wanted to end up there? Is it kind of that you just fell into it? Or you realize that those were all of those things and that's a way in which you can express all those things together? Like, how did it come about that you ended up at that intersection? I think I just like all of those things. And I've had, like, such a career journey. Like, I didn't start out as a motion designer or a designer for that matter. Um, I went to Flagler College for um, media production, so I was a video editor primarily. And when I started at the journal, um, I was a video editor. I was starting off editing um, like Facebook videos, like 
panda escapes from the zoo with like a twist on screen. <laughs> oh, we've all been jerking. there. Right. Like that was how I got started. Um, but how I got into motion graphics was I kept like seeing opportunities to where I could like zhuzh things up a little bit, add a little flavor. And um, I got frustrated at myself because I was like, I want to do this, but I kind of don't know how, aside from just doing like some pretty simple keyframing in Premiere. And so when I first started at the journal, I wasn't full time. I was freelance and I was freelancing like two or three days a week. And during my days off, because I was new to New York and did not have a social life, I would take my time off to like the binge. Uh, After Effects tutorials on YouTube and just like watch a bunch of stuff. So that way when I would go to the journal um, to like work, I would like know a little bit more about that stuff so I could incorporate it in the videos. Um, And so I was doing that more and more and the managers at the journal were noticing, oh, you know how to do this stuff? And I was like, yeah, like I totally know what I'm doing. (laughs) You have a really great way of like, you're also like very confident working next to her. Like they come and like, oh yeah, totally. Give me a second. And then you'd be like, <laughs> but it's amazing because it got you, I mean, very quickly, you got so many jobs at the journal to do motion design and other people may have taken like a slower path of like, oh, well, I'm not there yet. I don't know yet. But you were very, your confidence led you to acquire those skills so quickly. And yeah, it was really cool to see him. I mean, what I try to tell people is like, I'm not confident in myself because I think I know everything, quite the opposite. You know, I'm always learning and I'm always like seeking opportunities to learn new things. Um, But I'm confident in myself because I know, I'm confident that I will figure it out. Like whatever it is, like I know I will find a way to like make the deadline or I'll find a way to Google the thing or frantically YouTube the thing that I need to learn on time. Um, I'm not confident again. Yeah. Cause I think I know everything. It's just cause I know I'll figure out a way to do it. <laughs> you know, that is awesome. Wait, so there's the knowing you'll figure it out, but there's also this piece about taste and, and it seems like you really have good taste. Where the hell did that come from? Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like where did you figure out how to make things that were pretty or beautiful or wow. expressive and layered? Like, yeah. How did, I mean, that you can't Google that or YouTube that, I'm assuming. So where did that come from? I mean, look, I think I learned how to make things pretty by making a bunch of ugly stuff first. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you don't just come out in your creative practice, everything looking perfect and exactly the way that you envision it in your head. I've had a, even, you know, now sometimes I'll go to draw stuff and I'll draw it like 60 times or like I'll even draw the same line like four times because I'm like this just isn't really coming out the way that like I'm envisioning it and it's just it's a it's a practice that's why they call art I think like a practice because it is about it's like nothing's gonna come out perfect the very first time um in fact I actually have like I'm such a dork I keep it on my desk I have a sticky note that just says like try it a different way oh I love that (laughs) Because it reminds me that, like, I need to keep trying things a different way and, um, yeah, not get, like, bogged down, you know? So, anyway. Did you know that, how to all- draw already? Like, wh- how many skills did you already have kind of in your back pocket? They were like, okay, I'm taking it to the next level. Or was it like, I also have to go to the fundamentals of, like, drawing or just feeling it out? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I grew up, like, doodling a lot I used to make little comics for my parents as a kid and I would like draw them out and like present it to my parents on the couch at the end of the night like this little comic so I was always I always had like this kind of storytelling gene where I wanted to like tell stories and draw stuff um but I won't say the drawings were particularly good um it was just something that was fun for me to do I think when I was in college, like late in college is when I started to realize that I was really interested in design, but it was kind of too late for me to switch to a graphic design major. So I started um, like learning it different ways. I would make posters in college for events and stuff like that, um, just with like clip art and like really basic stuff on Photoshop and Illustrator. Um, 
And I remember moving to New York and being really, really inspired by the art here and specifically like the Link NYC terminals that you see around that have like the artwork on them from different artists in the area. Okay. And being like, these are so cool. I would love to do something like this uh, one day and just like get more into art and design. And so um, really, again, when I was at the journal, I sought that opportunity to incorporate more design and animation into my video editing work. Because um, I still love the video edit. And when I was freelancing, I did it quite a bit. Um, but yeah, I think circling back almost to your original question, like I love a little bit of everything. And I love just having a bunch of little tools in my tool belt to build the best looking thing. So I think that's part of the inspiration for me to like grow my knowledge in all these different areas, if that makes sense. That makes so much sense. I was actually going to ask you about tools. It it's a, for some people, it's going to be a bit technical, but I think it's really fascinating. You know, it's kind of like, you know, asking Picasso, what mediums does he play? And, and it turned out it was everything. Um, you know, it's, I think it's really fascinating to, to talk about that. So I was really curious, like you mentioned style, you know, drawing something, I'm assuming that's on a stylus. Are you doing, are you all digital? Like what's, what does it look like when you go out into the world and you take, and you see something, are you capturing it as an image somewhere? How do you keep all of these reference in your head and what tools are you using to, to make all of this happen? It's a great question. It's a little bit of everything, but I would say it's more digital than it is physical. Um, if I'm out in the wild and I like have an idea for drawing something later, I'll usually like write it down in my notes app, just like a brief description of what it is. Um, I don't carry paper or anything with me. I know a lot of artists do. I usually just sketch it down that way. Um, but I would say the main tools that I'm using, like specifically for drawing, um, I have a Wacom Cintiq here that I use sometimes, um, just to add more detail. Like I'll bring something into uh, Illustrator or something to like polish up and then I'll put it back into Photoshop to like add texture and stuff like that. Um, and I also use my iPad, I'll use Procreate and kind of more recently, um, they just released a new app called Procreate Dreams that. I haven't delved super deep into yet, but it seems really cool and super promising um, as a software. So, um, but I'll use Procreate as well, just to like, I don't know, do some rough drawings. Um, but if I want to polish it up, I'm almost always like bringing it into Illustrator to vectorize it. And That's very cool. And then of course you're using After Effects and sometimes Premiere and the rest of it. And, yeah. And, and this all happens out of your home at this point in time, or do you do you go into the studio or? Yeah. Have, yeah. Mostly just this 800 square feet of <laughs> magic. Imagine where the magic happened. <laughs> yeah. Do you have like those videos for uh, Instagram always has the videos of like what you look like while you're editing? There's like, like um, one of them, the person just sitting there all day, just like staring out into the space. And then it's like 2 a.m. and all of a sudden they're like, <laughs> and like me, I know it's just like a whole series of faces if I'm just like, like if someone were to film me and what's going on in my computer, just like <laughs> constant faces. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I feel like when I'm editing, I'm like, like a punch <laughs> over, <laughs> staring this close to the screen. And then I go to my eye doctor and they're like, oh, your vision got a little worse this year. I'm like, I have no idea why. <laughs> so weird. So you've got all these tools that you just mentioned that you're using. And one of the things, you know, Lache, I, he loves the technical and then I love the story part. And when you're bringing all mm -hmm. those tools together and you're thinking about storytelling and everybody is doing storytelling in different ways and using different tools, what is it about motion design that you think makes that type of storytelling so powerful or what gives you the butterflies about it? I mean, I think what I've always really loved about animation and like the combo of design and animation, motion graphics, whatever you want to call it specifically is um, when I was video editing at the journal, like I could pull B-roll from like Getty or, you know, the other stock websites, or I could find some like vector images off of Getty or another stock website, iStock or something, whatever we were using. Um, but like, I wouldn't always be able to find the thing that I needed. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so um, kind of the beautiful, powerful part about design and animation is the ability to kind of create something out of thin air, like something out of nothing, right? 
um, you might be able to go and like shoot a scene um, as a cinematographer to like get the exact thing you need. And that's kind of like, I feel like the cinematography version of that. Um, but like animation is truly like from scratch, you know? And so there's something really exciting about that. Just like building a whole world where there was once kind of a blank canvas and Adobe Illustrator or After Effects. There's just something kind of, I don't know, magical about that to me. So you, you live in New York, which is a very trendy place. And it, and it seems like you're finding inspiration there. But there are also all these online. And because animation is animation, I imagine, are there a lot of online resources that you turn to to kind of see trends or see things that get you excited? Or like, where do you, where do you turn to for, for some of that inspiration um, around you? Yeah, um, I think I'm following a lot of other really cool artists on Instagram. So, you know, I keep up with what they're up to and I'm always like looking at new stuff and being like, oh, that's so cool. Like, I wonder how they did this. Um, so that's kind of a way I keep up. I want to say Pinterest, but I feel like I don't use Pinterest really as much. And as I if I saw your Instagram correctly, the other day you were on Pinterest and you were your own inspiration. I was like, <laughs> Wait, what? yeah, I was like trying to work on this holiday animation that I'm working on right now. Um, and I was like looking up inspiration on Pinterest and I like saw something I did like five years ago is like the first pen and I was like, oh geez, like <laughs> I'm gonna log off. <laughs> what do you do after that? <laughs> Go buy yourself was, a drink or something? Like that stuff. I was like, oh that's cool to see, but I was like, this doesn't help me. You like <laughs> thing. Like I'm looking for other inspiration. Um but yeah, I think um I'm just kinda I try to stay plugged into the industry. I try to see like what other artists are doing, what other agencies are up to. Um, like kind of the ad stuff that I see out in the wild in New York. Um, and I get inspiration too from like, I don't know, fashion, like going out, like seeing the way people are dressed, like the color palettes, the textures, I don't know, stuff like that. Um, I try to get inspiration from like a little bit of everywhere, if that makes sense. So. Yeah, absolutely. No, it makes sense, especially considering the fact that you had said that the art form requires so many different inputs. It makes sense that you would get inspiration from it. And quite frankly, it shows up in your motion graphics. It shows up in what you do. Uh, and I mean that as a compliment. It's really cool to see all of those layers. I, I found myself thinking uh, about some children's books do all of this beautiful layering. And they're just these beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, objects to, to really look at again and again. And I feel like that's how a lot of your work is, where it, it just has so many layers that... You just want to go back and look at it again to say, wait a second, did she really just add that little grid line? And it, how in the world did Heather do that? Maybe that's not everybody. That's definitely where my head goes. Oh, no, I've I always loved your layers, the textures. You'll have so many different textures playing in one image and then lines. And you just definitely build a lot of complexity in all of your animations and motion design. And that made me think you mentioned the human experience and bringing human, the human experience into design. What do you bring to your design that you feel is like specific of colors that you like? I know like for me, I, well, I like music, um, but then also having a moment for B-roll to breathe and to hear the sound of it. And a lot of people don't like that, but what is it that you love that you bring into your motion design that makes it so special? Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of like dive into two parts of this and like one, I'll kind of like address the layering thing. And then the second thing I'll kind of go into like, kind of like how my personality is like injected into my work, whether I mean for it to always be or not. <laughs> but when it comes to the layering thing, I think the reason why I like that style is like, usually I'll start off with something like really kind of plain. Maybe it's just like two shapes and some text. And I'll look at it and I'll be I'll like, do a RAM preview of it and be like, rad, I don't know if I like this. Be like, what if I just like added a little thing here and I like play it again? I'll be like, man, I don't know about that either. Like, what if I just add a little bit more? And I'll just like ask myself, like, what can I add here? That's just like a little bit more, like a little bit more visually interesting, right? And so I think it starts off like kind of plain, but like by the time I'm done, like, I don't know, asking myself like what else could I add to this like 
like, what else can I do to like try this a little bit differently? Um, I'll have something that I'm like, oh, okay, like this feels good. This feels like organic. Um, so that's kind of like how my layering process works. Cause I'm just like always asking, what can I add to this? Can I add like something a little bit more, whether it's like a secondary ease on the animation or like another texture or something like that. Right. Um, and when it comes to like my own, how I inject like my personality into my work and my teaching and stuff like that, um, I'm like a very <laughs> colorful, like dorky, optimistic person. I think anybody who knows me knows that. Like I have a very loud, obnoxious laugh. Um, and I'm just like, I don't know, kind of a cheerful <laughs> person at art. So um, my work is like very colorful and playful and um, at its best, it's like kind of work that makes you go like, hmm, like makes you think a little bit. Um, like I did an illustration recently. I've been thinking a lot about like technology and like how influential it's been really like the past 30 years of all of human history, right? Like, yeah. It's like we base so much of our lives around this thing that has really only been around for like 30 years. <laughs> um, don't quote me on the 30 years thing. Wait. <laughs> He's been a little longer. Got it. It's a print. We got it. A little longer. <laughs> like maybe some like 70s, 80s. When it really started to pick up. But um, yeah, so I made this illustration recently and it was like a Roman bus like looking at an iPhone. And it's just like stuff like that that I really like to illustrate and work on. Just like things that have like a slight like juxtaposition to them, you know? So anyway. I, I was kind of hoping that the secret answer was going to be also. And, and I also, in every single clip, if you look and zoom in, you'll actually see Heather Seidel written. <laughs> yeah. oh, <that'd> be cool. <laughs> It's actually my, me going like this <laughs> <laughs> for one frame. <laughs> and like with all the stuff that you being willing to bring yourself and your personality, things that you like into your work. Some people, when they first start out and they're trying to figure out who they are and what their voice is, they may struggle with that. And you spend a lot of time teaching people. What are the things that you tell them in order to build up who they are as an artist and to create their own style and become better at it. Yeah. Well, absolutely. I think the first thing to know is um, it's okay if your style changes like throughout your practice. I know that mine has, like my work doesn't look exactly like it did 10 years ago when I was first starting to do this stuff, right? Um, and thank God for that. <laughs> we're, we're always learning, right? We're always learning and improving. Um, I think you're doing a service to yourself if you can look back on your work 10 years prior and cringe a little bit personally. It means like you've grown. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think just to know like it's okay if your style is changing and evolving and adapting. Um, and then the other thing that I usually recommend people do is to look at the work of people um, that really inspire you and work that really inspires you and start kind of like putting it together whether it's on like a Pinterest board or like a Melano board or kind of whatever software you use and looking at it and saying like, why does this feel good to me? Like, what is the commonality between all of these things that's like really resonating with me? You know, because I think everybody is drawn to like different types of work for different reasons based on the human experience like we were talking about. And um, kind of like pinpointing those things, like are the commonalities like the color palette are the commonalities that like all of these designs or animation have like a little bit of collage on it? Um, you know, is it like heavy use of typography? Like what is it that is like really interesting to you about this work that you enjoy? And then saying like, how do I want to incorporate that into mind practice, right? Um, like how do I want to make that like my style? But I think first it's identifying like, what are the things that really draw you into the work? Um, if that makes sense. So when you look back on that stuff at the beginning that you said sometimes makes you cringe, which is everybody when they look at you like, oh, they did. what are the things that you weren't doing then that you're doing now? Technical things even that have made the difference in how your animations look. Yeah, I think like a big part of it um, as a young animator was just easing, like learning how to ease things well and not have my animations be like super linear looking um and just like 
yeah, I think that really helps draw the eye and create some visual interest when you're able to ease things really well. And when I was first starting out, I was like bad at it. <laughs> and I, think a lot, I think a lot of people when they're first starting out, uh, that's like a skill set that you need to grow. So yeah, cool. yeah there's kind of, it, you, you made me think of it, it for some reason, it reminds me of the, those first days of animation where you're trying to figure it out. It's like moving a chess piece. Like I'll move this piece and then I'll move this piece, and then I move this piece, but it doesn't have to work that way. It can be much more fluid and, and flowing. And I, I'm, I'm definitely guilty of that. You know, the first animations are, well, I'm gonna date myself here. My first animations were actually in something called Logo Writer. And you had no other choice but to actually have one thing move at a time. So I actually did this, uh, this was when I was in fifth grade. I did this animation sequence of a, of a soccer game, and uh, the goal, <laughs> The the striker kicks the ball. It was a, a penalty shot. The striker kicks the ball because of how the animation worked. I had to handle it one of two ways. It was either that I could have the ball move, like the ball move, and then the goalie move, and the ball move, and the goalie move, and the ball move, and the goalie move. But it meant that the the shot was like this. <laughs> so what I ended up doing instead was I just made the the shot really fast, and then the goalie dives, which also looks so stupid, right? And it's like whoop. whoop. And it is just like, you know, the beautiful thing about the present is it doesn't have to work that way at all. The machines, to your point, can handle it. The work that you're doing with easing, with all of this complexity, all of it's possible, which is like mind-blowingly cool. So it's more than 30 years, <laughs> to be honest, uh, ago that, that tech was at this level, or it was a big part of human human life. And you're riding this in such a beautiful way now which is so exciting. So it's just fun to see where you're going to take it. So that's that's my long-winded thoughts about the past and the future and where you fit in. When you did that whole linear thing, you were talking about how, and I know that I've done that when I've tried to do after things, like this happens, then this happens, then this happens. It made me think of life and what naturally happens in life and that multiple things are like happening at the same time. How does an animator see the world? What are you looking at when you're walking down the street or just out and about that you then try and recreate and you're like, oh, well, this is how the world works. And so then this is how animation should work. How do you view the world? What is, take me in your mind. <laughs> I mean, I think as an animator, like I'm not always in animation mode, but um, when I'm walking around, but when I am, I'm definitely like more attuned to like paying attention to like how things move or if things are moving in an interesting way like somebody's like walking really confidently or like, you know, has like a really interesting outfit on and has like a big dog and they're walking them through like Central Park and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, that would be like a cool animation, like to like recreate like this scene because it's so like colorful and fun and bold, right? Um, so sometimes I'm like viewing the world in that lens or um, the other day I was walking by um, a local restaurant and there was a line cook out. Um, it had like just rained and so it was like that beautiful like sunset glow like puddles on the concrete situation and there's a line cook sitting outside like smoking a cigarette and the smoke was just like the most beautiful like i don't I mean, i'm not a cigarette smoker but <laughs> I don't, I don't trendy. Mean, I don't and i really needed to smoke after that moment <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the smoke like coming from the cigarette was just like so cinematic and beautiful and yeah. it, like made me want to go home and like peter made some smoke i don't I don't know. <laughs> so um, just like moments like that, yeah, I yeah. think uh, my brain is like kind of tuned into those things. But I try also to like not be in animation mode all the time. But sometimes yeah. I can't help it. You know what I mean? So I was wondering, I did want to know, freelance, like you've had this journey of news, journalism. You've gone into more television, MTV. Um, then you went on this whole freelance journey. And now you're back with company. How does all of that play? What it, what are the lessons that you've taken, especially from the freelance part, you know, to go from one industry to another to take that? I mean, going freelance is a huge leap too, um, in a totally different structure. What are the lessons that you learned from having all those different experiences and what decisions have you had to make? I think if you haven't been able to tell by now, I love and thrive in variety. Like I love learning and I love trying a variety of different things. 
So um, even when I was like early in journalism, like what I really loved about that medium is we would always be getting in different stories to tell, right? It was like never the same thing. So um, when I eventually, you know, when I was at the journal, that was really great. And then I moved on to NBC News. I had a great time there, learned a lot from like my fellow animation team, was wonderful. And then um, when I decided to go freelance, really what that was for me is I had been working in journalism for like seven years at that point. And I think I was just like ready to try and animate with like some new boundaries and new constraints and like um, see what that would be like. And so, um, you know, one of the first gigs I got was for Google. And it was very different, but it was also really exciting. And that excitement like drove me to like try to make the best possible thing. Um, and freelancing was really wonderful. Like I, I loved freelancing and a big part of that was the variety, right? Like getting to work with like brands like Google, brands like Paramount, um, you know, all sorts of people across all different industries and like getting to tell those stories. And as even what I like about my, my job now is the variety, like working with all the different clients that we do, like every day is a little bit different. And so um, just having that mindset of like, I'm always learning, I'm always adapting, um, to my surroundings and um, like what can I learn and take away from this experience is just like kind of a mindset thing that I have you know I'm like a dork I'm the nerd like I love it I have been I've been really interested in finding out about where everything is going where where all these trends are going so where do you think animation is heading um, like maybe it's where do you want to take your career, but also where do you think animation might come up against other new technologies? We just did something about AI. I'm curious about what your thoughts are there. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about your, about Heather's predictions of the future. I don't know if I have any like crystal ball predictions about the future of animation, but um, one thing that's really exciting about the medium is that it's always changing and adapting like I know the animation industry as it was five years ago looks a little bit different than it does today. You know, like we have new tools, people are, um, you know, getting more into 3D because it's a little bit more accessible than it used to be. There's platforms like Blender and Spline and um, stuff like that that are making 3D a little bit like more affordable for students and stuff like that to learn. And also like way back, if you wanted to render something in 3D, it like took forever. And now it's like a little bit faster, like computers are getting faster at doing that stuff, um, graphics cards, et cetera. So um, I think like as technology progresses and things like that get faster and more programs get released, um, we're gonna see like more, maybe more people picking it up or um, diving into it or like certain things getting faster. Um, and I think when it comes to AI, I don't have any like specific AI predictions on how that's going to shake up the animation industry or anything like that. Um, the way that I sort of used AI as a visual tool when I was freelancing was kind of just to get like reference on stuff that like maybe an idea that I had in my head. So like if I, I don't know, I'm thinking of like a holiday specific one. If I wanted to go into um, Dolly and put in like Santa Claus on a beach in Miami, sipping a Negroni, wide angle. Like I could like get a, a few ideas of like what that looked like because it would be hard for me to like find a specific Google images reference for that. So um, that's like how I have used AI in the past in my practice. I also know um, some animators that have used chat GPT to help them write expressions in After Effects. Um, I don't think that's foolproof. Um, I know like some folks have also had issues with it or they've had to correct some things, stuff like that. It's not like 100%. Um, but I know folks that have like used it in order to kind of get a starting point on some expressions. So I think stuff like that is really interesting and really cool. Um, I personally still don't see AI like knock on wood, replacing artists of the things that we do and like the human experience that we bring to our work personally. Um, but yeah. I don't know. That's kind of like what I think about the animation industry. I mean, I'm excited. It's, it's definitely always an evolving industry. We're always having to like learn new things and um, new tools that are coming out. And that's what I really like about it as a forever learner type person. It has been so amazing to see 
how far you like your career to be have been sitting next to you as you started all of this and now to see your work and to see you finding yourself on pinterest that's probably for me that's like that's the coolest moment ever you know you have arrived when um but it's just been amazing to follow your journey and to be able to have you contribute skills to our business has been amazing and um i just can't wait to see everything that that comes in the future we have to keep us oh. abreast to all the cool new trends and stuff that we need to um, pay attention um, to. One time you came in with a Pinterest board for one of the projects that we were going to do, but you couldn't animate it, but you uh, helped us with the planning of it. Yeah. And, oh, man. First off, I'd like, it went very well. But also, <laughs> that was awesome. Just to see how you think about everything and, and where you're pulling inspiration from and getting from point A to point B with your animation. It's been amazing to see your journey and Thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us today and give us some insights into how you think and how you see the world and where animation's going. Of course. It's always so great to see both of you. And um, let's hang out again soon.